I think as far as TikTok goes at the moment, the risk is not worth the reward. But I think it's interesting that a lot of platforms have gone in enough on it, not for their love of short form video, but their love of the reach and the, the, the stories that have been told about audience access, that it's going to be hard to wean themselves off of it. And so you get situations like the BBC where you go, we are deeply concerned about its privacy and security. Don't have it on your phone, reporters. Just let's hope everyone else keeps it on their phone so they can enjoy our sweet, sweet short form BBC content. Welcome to Punchy by Rival, where we take the gloves off to share the hard-hitting realities of the challenger marketing world. Each week, we'll break down the buzz and cut through the BS, the top stories and trends to tell you what you really need to know and do differently to grow your brand and career. Welcome to Punchy. I'm in a booth here in a WeWork and I forgot my mic. It's always one of us this week. It's me. Dubose is in his new apartment, not flat in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. And for those of you who are watching, I just want to draw your attention to the slight small triangle in the upper, right above his left shoulder there, that now that you've seen it, you cannot unsee it and will forever bother you. But he's going to get it painted because his super is very responsive and attentive. And then we got Jenna, newly moved to London. They let you in again. Look at this. They did. I even had to go to the person and he looked at me and took my fingerprints and everything and still let me in. Great. Bad move by them. Bad move by them, yeah. but good for us. All right. We got a quick one today. So let's get into it. Three stories in house version of Punchy. We're back to having guests from next week. So, story number one from Digiday and every news source right now US marketers prepare contingency plans amid potential TikTok ban. Jenna is raising her hands and doing some type of dance if you're listening to this. Yeah. So, summary of this article, possible U.S. TikTok ban creates uncertainty for marketers and agencies, prompting contingency planning. If you haven't seen this story, you really should go read up on it. But basically, proposed legislation targets foreign government ownership and control, potentially affecting other Chinese-owned companies as well. L'Oreal CMO, as one example, says contingency planning is part of their approach to all media partners, although this seems to have a little bit more urgency. There are potential alternative short form video platforms, Instagram Reels, YouTube Shorts, uh, Snapchat, etc. But brands may need to remove TikTok tracking pixels if the platform is banned. There's also an article in here about the BBC advising staff to delete TikTok from work phones. So Jenna, obviously, I'm going to have to start with you. Can you break this down for us and tell us what marketers should be doing at this point around this potential ban? Uh, it's very simple. TikTok is Chinese spyware. I will. I do have to say, though, um, I have less of a problem with it being specifically Chinese spyware than I have with it just being like spyware generally. And so I'm not crazy about the government solution to this being like based around foreign ownership of like these types of things rather than just companies should not be able to collect unlimited amounts of behavioral data to construct like dossiers on every individual human that lives in a state. And so maybe marketers should be preparing for a reality that we want to live in, which is namely that companies shouldn't be allowed to do that and that they should take their contingency planning to, you know, beyond TikTok, what types of changes may be coming to the privacy landscape if we do not wish to live in a horrifying dystopia where com private companies track everything you say and do with impunity. So get off TikTok, reevaluate all your other stuff, because just because Facebook and Google and Microsoft and whoever and Amazon are American companies, they're still doing this shit and marketers should change it. So you know the question I'm going to ask, which is what I always ask, there it is. Um, so are you saying that marketers should be removing their spending from TikTok and potentially other social platforms right now? I, I, uh, for TikTok, I think that the answer is absolutely like a no brainer, right? Like, okay. you know, yeah, like I, I is, yes, you should not be spending money on TikTok. Like, um, not even just like say for, for ethical reasons, although I think there are super, super strong arguments for that. Like there are plenty of things that you can do in other places. TikTok is uniquely bad amongst social and like digital platforms for the amount of data information that it, that it takes from customers. I have 
zero doubts that actually the way that like data is collected and and managed and controlled by like subjects, especially like within the EU, is certainly violating extant right now privacy like regulations and controls. That the veneer of local ownership of of TikTok and like in certain countries is exactly that is just a veneer. And that all of this data is being extracted and processed elsewhere in violation of multiple laws in multiple countries. It is a massive risk to be on this platform. It is absolutely not worth it, especially when yeah, other platforms like offer you know these types of short form reels and content. And it's not like Gen Z is difficult to reach other places on their phone. Do buzz. I mean, I, I, I love the idea that what we, we need to do is find some homegrown spyware we can rally around and, and sing the national anthem while sharing our data to. I mean, I, I, I do think there's a very strong point there, and, it, and it's, it's a quite an interesting one, that you can strip the xenophobia out of this discussion and still just go, it, there, there is a data privacy, data collection issue that TikTok still you know, stands further from others on. I think it's interesting when we think about things like the BBC, because actually you know, there's an interesting point in the story where they're going to continue using TikTok for editorial and marketing purposes, but then not allow any of their employees to have TikTok on their phone, which I, I imagine requires some kind of airlock that you pass content through to a special phone. But I don't really know how it's going to work. But, but I think it is intriguing because it does touch on a few things here. It touches on the idea that as a brand, like contingency plans should be necessary, right? That bit isn't news. Like pretty much every channel, if something were to go wrong, if you needed to switch from something, if attribution was proven to be wrong on a certain thing, if measurement was wrong, you would need to be able to shift your money. Scenario planning is one of the, the core things any good brand does. I think as far as TikTok goes at the moment, the risk is not worth the reward. But I think it's interesting that a lot of platforms have gone in enough on it, not for their love of short form video, but their love of the reach and the, the the stories they've been told about audience access, that it's going to be hard to wean themselves off of it. And so you get situations like the BBC, where you go, we are deeply concerned about its privacy and security. Don't have it on your phone, reporters. Just let's hope everyone else keeps it on their phone so they can enjoy our sweet, sweet short form BBC content. So I think that's that's the interesting duality we live in at the moment. It's dangerous enough that you know, internally we should avoid it, but externally everyone should still yeah, love it so they can engage with us. And I think, yeah, the funny thing here is for other platforms that have offered short form video, this is truly an open goal right now. Your largest competitor in the space for this format is now basically weighted into a diplomacy and state building conversation. All you have to do is make YouTube shorts or you know, reels seem 5% more viable and exciting and you can win. Someone please kick the football before Lucy pulls it up. It's not that hard. All right. Well, a very important and significant story to watch. And yeah, I think that contingency planning is probably good for most businesses to be doing, but you know, this is one where it's probably time to take some action. Moving on to story number two. And if you were, well, really everybody, but if you're in the startup world, particularly if you're in the VC startup world, like we are, then this has been the one that, um, through last weekend, or was it the weekend before two weekends ago? turned your world upside down and still is making a lot of us very nervous. Of course, we are talking about Silicon Valley Bank's collapse, but more specifically, an article here from Marketing Dive talking about how it is compounding a general marketing slowdown. So summary of the article, SVP collapse, their collapse impacts industries, especially early stage startups struggling to raise capital. It wasn't exactly a, a bull market over the last year or so to begin with. And in general, economic uncertainty accelerates consolidation, but also just makes it harder for companies to think about investing in growth. They're playing a lot more defense. Their you know, marketing is often one of the first uh, areas because it's viewed as a cost center, which is a sec uh, separate conversation, one of the first areas to get cut. So we do expect ad spending to continue to drop. We do expect and have seen companies that are just you know, holding back on some marketing investment until they see how this all plays out. Dubos, I'm going to start with you. I think the play, I think the way to tee it up is, you know, for marketers out there who are probably, whether they're directly affected or not, this is probably something that they're thinking about. The planning, the budgeting, the internal conversations with CFOs and CEOs around 
How do we manage our spend? What's the right thing to do? Of course, we've talked in the past about how actually when other brands pull out of the market, there is an opportunity and potential long-term benefit to actually going in. So what would you advise marketers out there listening to be doing with this new thread in the general fabric of an economic slowdown that's happening right now? I think, you know, something like this, it, it, a, a bank run is always one of those things that's very useful to remember, uh, to remind you you're mortal. I think it's, it, it, obviously there's a consolidation here in venture capital that one argues was inevitable to happen at some point. I think happening in this kind of style of, of very dramatic and mainstream news uh, has only compounded how scary it is for everyone within the business ecosystem. But I think, you know, one of the the key things I think to remember here is, yes, it has made things slightly riskier, but that risk was always there. I think, you know, there's a real sense when it comes to economic uncertainty that we've told ourselves there was a time where there was no risk, a kind of bedtime story marketers tell to themselves so they can go to sleep. And I think at the end of the day, risk is inherent in business and in marketing in a way that we need to grow comfortable and accept, but also try to mitigate where possible. And I think, yeah, when we talk about the idea of leaning in when others lean out, I think it is a much easier uh, thing to say than do. I think we would all agree that like you know, the, the equivalent of kind of yelling by the dip while the crypto market was tanking. But at the same point, I think there is empirical evidence that shows that businesses in a recession, in a time of uncertainty, a time of a fear that smartly put money in, double down on the the propositions they know work. It's not a time to reinvent a new act for yourself. And then back those very clear, valuable propositions with investment as others in the market may pull back or as others in the market may wait and see are going to get gains. And I think this is yet another thing that is going to ratchet up uncertainty for marketers and those that rather smartly accept that that risk has always been there that implement plans to mitigate it where possible, and that carry on investing in a way where they're going to put themselves out in front of consumers or in the market should see positive gains. Jenna? I'm not thrilled that this seems to have led to like the new, I was going to play for the Patriots, but then I got a knee injury like line. Like I was just like on this flight that I was just on. Some really obnoxious guy in my room was like, yeah, I had like four million in VC funding lined up and then the SVB thing and then it did and then it evaporated. And that may very well be true, but um, I'm not looking forward to the next several years of like dealing with like, entrepreneurs be like, yeah, man, I had I had I could, I could, that could have been me. I feel like it could have been my unicorn moment because that's going to suck. Um, yeah, like, I, uh, I don't know. For, like for marketers, I don't. I don't necessarily know what this means. I think it's maybe not. Like I say, you know, really great in the short term. In particular, for some of the you know the smaller, you know, martech startups that you know we've really seen kind of come onto this you know come onto the scene in the last like, couple of years. Um, at a time when you know, as much as like say I rail against like Google and like the big guys like in the in the ad tech space, like there's been a lot of expansion like in the the types of like players um and the like, companies that are like starting to come in and like you know make some money and like make an impact in the ad tech space and, like their usefulness and obviously anything that takes away you know funding and access to you know give those types of companies you know some sort of like footing to actually go be competitive in a marketplace i think is not is not good um you know, as, as you said earlier, Eric, what's like, you know, that, that increases that tendency towards consolidation. But like, hopefully then, you know, some, I guess the ideal situation is that like, you know, some bank will take the core tenant of what SVB was doing, which was that like actually startup businesses do have some signs that indicate like when they are like credit worthy in some, in, in some instances, and it's probably worthwhile and valuable to accept some risk for those things to start to fund those types of initiatives. Because I, I do think that like, while the economy is tightening uh, and it's not going to be maybe a pretty 18 to 24 months um, with the big tech layoffs um, that have been going on, like I and like all, how easy it is now and how low the barrier to entry is with like new AI and ML tools to do cool shit in marketing. I hope against hope, I guess, that like those types of like new companies and like startups will still have access to capital and we can still see some of the cool stuff we've seen in MarTech recently. Yeah. That's my two cents. Yeah. I, I mean, the only thing that I would add is like, you know, obviously you got to see how it all pans out and it is what it is in terms of some of these companies taking knocks and just more uncertainty in the market. It's obviously not great. 
I think the only other tactical recommendation that I would give people is, I think if you're a marketer within any stage organization, I think there's an opportunity to kind of show that you understand the big picture. I know that we've been talking about just like, well, what does marketing do? But I'm just thinking about, you know, some of these marketers and organizations that are going to have their CEO, their CFO coming to them and be like, look, we need to pull back. And of course, your remit is to make sure that you're driving long-term growth of the brand and the business. That's what marketing does. But at the same time, being able to take a step back and show that you understand the bigger implications of this and not just kind of be in your silo of like, well, we need to be spending because we need to be spending. I think that's an opportunity. So that's the only other thing that I would add. But yeah, it's been a, it's been a scary, really, um, and not great couple weeks for a lot of businesses. Moving on to our last story, a new app launches through Apple hoping to win with zero party data when others haven't. Caden, I think I'm saying that right, a new app allows users to exchange personal data for money and focuses on zero party data collection. It's launched on the Apple's App Store with partnerships including Uber, Airbnb, Netflix, 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 Amazon, and Apple's Health Kit. It aims to allow users to make $15 to $20 per month initially potentially increasing to $600 per year and more. Jenna, your favorite topic after fuck TikTok is fuck zero party data. So do you want to take this one to start? I, like to be clear, like my issue with it is it like, and as as this guy says, like here is it like what like what like you that you can't have data that no one is a party to. Like by definition, it's somebody like someone is a party to the data. Like if it's your uh, sorry, it's a semantic. It's a semantic bug bugaboo. It bothers me. Well, we hate debating semantic points, so that's totally not relevant. <laughs> it's just like. I don't know. I like I fine. It's probably here to stay. I feel like I'm going to end up sounding like one of those fucking like funny duddies about like, you know, I don't even know. I'm really tired. But like, I, I feel like I'm like, so I'm, you know, beating against the tide here. So I guess I'll just like accept it. Um, I like, I don't know. I really struggle with like, like with these things. It's like, you know, hey, this is ostensibly, you know, like a like a virtuous attempt at being like, hey, you know, we're going to put users in control of their data. Like we're going to help them like directly monetize it, which I do think like recognizes two like pretty like important fundamental things, which is that like Google and Facebook, you know, their market cap is entirely based off the harvesting of you and your information. Like that's like what you are worth to them. But um, I struggle with this idea of like, oh, well, yeah, like people can consent where I think that like consent really, but at least the way that we tend to use it, like for these types of things really hinges on informed consent. And it's just very difficult to be truly informed about like what is happening to your data or like what the real value of like your data is like for these types of things. It's interesting. I think it's interesting, but I, but I, you know, it's this the same. There's been apps I think that are like similar to this type of value exchange, like already, of like, you know, VPNs or like other like apps that are basically are ad free, and you're knowingly or not like renting out the excess bandwidth on your internet connection, or like if you have a VPN, like you get the VPN for free, but you every single piece of your data is collected like going in and out of it. And I think that this is kind of another one of those apps that it's like. This feels a little disingenuous to me and like the value exchange um, because I'm not really sure, but I'm interested to see where it goes. I'm interested to see where it goes. Yeah. Tabos, you got one minute. What do you got? I'm, I, 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 it's funny, right? Because I think to Jenna's point about the being in control with your data, being in the driver's seat, like I, I, this is, you know, another attempt at it. I think it's, it's an interesting one, but I always kind of wonder two things when it comes to this. A, do consumers actually really want to be in control of their data or do they just not want a load of their data out there? Because a lot of this is predicated on the idea of be your own data broker, get your data out there in the right way. And I think, you know, it, it's interesting when we look at GDPR, when we've looked at some of the the kind of uh, notifications and opt in things that are coming out of that, like a load of people either don't read stuff and just click a button or they'll go, no, I don't want you to have any of this. So I think I always think with these types of things, Sooner or later, there's going to be a cultural shift where people go, actually, fine, my data is out there and I'm fine with that, but I want I want to make money off of it. And I think I don't know if we're there yet or I don't know if any party has done that well. I think the other thing I would say is I think it's been really interesting that so far data as a trade off has been a token economy, right? Like 
you know, people are very happy to go, ah, oh, I've, I've told Uber one more thing about myself and then I got a free ride or my credit score went up because I let them look at my bank account. Like that's effectively the same thing, but we're just not getting cold, hard cash for it. And I think the intriguing thing on all the startups that have always tried to, to monetize this kind of be your own data broker thing is once you put cold, hard money in front of someone, the calculus changes, right? It's the old, I'll help my friends move. If one of your friends goes, will you help me move? You go, yes. If one of your friends goes, uh, I'll pay you $15 an hour to help me move. You constantly start thinking about if it's worth it. So I think it's an intriguing thing here on how much is someone's data worth? Is this the right amount? Yeah. Is the weird lies, lies, and damn statistics thing they're doing in the article where they use per month to start with and per year later on going to fool anyone? No. But I think it's it's down to the idea that I don't know if consumers are ready for this. And even if they are, I don't know if anyone's built a brand strong enough to get over that implicit trade-off to explicit financial trade-off. And that's going to be an intriguing one to see play out. Tobose, I would help you move for $15 an hour. I'm just saying. I know you just moved and didn't hire me, but next time. It's a steal. I would do that. Wick, I used to work as a, a mover. I think that's what you call them. <laughs> I'm a moving man. When I was in college, I liked it actually. You have to pick things up and put them down. You know, I like that kind of thing. Okay. It's the gym, but for money. All right. Rants and raves. Dubose, what do you and the tiny unpainted triangle above your left shoulder have to rant or rave about today? And the unpainted triangle will not shut up about... It's a metaphor for something. Exactly. I don't know what it is a metaphor for. Uh, I think one of the things I, I want to rant about uh, is I, I think you know it's interesting that the hype cycle around AI in marketing has, has already gotten to a point where I think we're rapidly approaching farce while simultaneously finding useful uh, kind of cases and new entrants. So I think it's funny. It's a, I, I, we were, I was talking to someone about it earlier this week, and it's kind of the Schrodinger's cat of bullshit. Something can be simultaneously already played out, but then also very exciting about where it's going. So you know, I would like to rant about the idea that I, I think we, we can't break our new toys as marketers and, and people interested in technology that quickly. And I feel like we, we are very rapidly degrading a term in an area before it's actually kind of even given us its full potential. I mean, you know, simultaneously, you have a, a hundred different startups trying to do random things. And then also you have Adobe uh, launching Firefly and, and other generative AI entrants this week that are incredibly exciting. So yeah, my, my rant is how can something be so exciting yet so bullshit at the same time? And will it, will it continue? Uh, the cat is in the box and it's probably dead. <laughs> I guess I, I guess I'll, I'll go rave the new, the nothing tech. I just really like their branding. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You posted that in the amp group, by the way, shout out for the amp group. If you want to join, let us know. It's actually really good. It's been really good. If you want more of Jenna saying fuck TikTok, I should learn it in other languages. We have other, we have other language speakers. I can probably figure out what it is. French. Anyways, uh, I, 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 I like the nothing tech branding. You know, I don't know. I haven't looked into it enough to know like how I feel about like how how far they go. I know that they have like a different you know uh, version of Android that they run for their phone kind of deal. But yeah, I just bought their new uh ear, their new ear pods because my old Apple ones are are going. Uh, I like the branding. I like the I like I, I like a, a new entrant to the smartphone and like wearable tech market. There's not that many of those. Like that's like a cool that's just cool. Like when you see like a brand like do uh, a a high barrier to entry like market like that and i feel like so they're kind of leaning into a little bit of the futurism but sort of simplicity with it to make a better like user experience which i think is going to start to be yeah, a bit of a backlash especially with gen z about like or you know you read about like gen z prefers books to like e-readers like those types of things i'm interested to see what kind of like the luddite backlash is in like branding for you know the next generation of tech it's interesting nothing tech they're cool rave I need to buy new earphones, actually, so we might talk to you about that. They're cheap. They were cheap, too. Yeah, I mean, the Apple ones are, like, just a ridiculous amount of money, and they basically last a year, that whole planned obsolescence genius that they've got going on over there. Okay, over on time, going to go. Punchy is a production of Rival. We are a growth consultancy that builds challenger brands, strategies, and capabilities to disrupt categories. If you want to learn more about us, check out wearerival.com. If you want to connect with Jenna, DuBose, or myself, 
email us at media at wearerival.com or find us on LinkedIn. If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe, share with anyone you think might enjoy it, and leave us a review. Thanks so much for listening and see you next week.